Let me get a drink real quick. How is it off? I don't know. Can you guys, can everyone hear me? Everyone good? All right, cool. All right, how's everyone doing this morning? Great? All right. Well, it's been an awesome service so far. Um, I'm going to try my best not to mess anything up, okay? So I'm going to keep this flowing here. Um, my name is Aaron Domingo. Uh, I serve in the campus ministry over at COD. Excited about that. And uh, I'm excited for my relationship with God. And uh, actually, what's exciting, some exciting news, um, I actually just turned four years old as a disciple uh, last month in October. So I'm very excited about that. Um, and actually, a lot of people don't know, but the first time I've been to a Desert City Church of Christ service wasn't four years ago. It was actually as a preteen. Um, a lot of you know uh, my cousin Cynthia. She's been around for a few, um, a number of years. And she used to take me and my cousins to Kids Kingdom, actually, as a preteen. And honestly, the only reason I came was because she would take us out to eat after. That's the only reason. I mean, honestly, I like as a, as a preteen, man, all I cared about was food, obviously. That need was met at church. Um, Saturday morning cartoons, that didn't conflict with church at all. And then uh, that's basically it. That's all I cared about. I mean, when I was that age, I didn't care about girls either. I mean, they were just kind of too weird for me. Like, I mean, they dressed different. They looked different. They had long hair. Like, what's that about, dude? You know, you got to cut that and get a mohawk or a mullet. I mean, that was kind of my, I guess, my thinking at the time. Um, but I do remember, I remember vividly, actually, um, Cynthia, my Cynthia, she bought us, a, uh, me and my cousins, an adventure Bible. You know, those Bibles that have pictures in there and all the condensed stories, right? And I remember this because I was at my grandma's house, and all my cousins were there. They're jumping on the couch, running around. And I remember because I, I read that whole Bible in one day. It was really cool. I called Cynthia and I was like, hey, Manang, you know, I read the whole Bible today and she was so excited. Um, and it was cool because I remember reading the stories and being inspired. I remember reading about Abraham, you know, and Moses and how he, he, he just, uh, he walked through the sea, right? And then Joshua and all the battles he won. And then it came to David and Goliath. I was like, oh my gosh, that took the cake, dude. I was ready to go home. <laughs> um, and man, like when you think about that story, David and Goliath, that's the greatest underdog story in history, right? And I was looking over again, and I was having it for my quiet times, and it's, 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 it's cool because when you think about that story, like, it's not really an underdog story at all. You know, when you think about it, who's the real hero here? God is, right? You know, you, obviously you can't take anything away from David. I mean, it took an incredible amount of faith for David to do what he did, right? But God is the hero, and he's the most amazing hero. You put him up against any hero you can think of. Superman. Man, he'll, 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 defeat, him that with, he'll defeat him with a snap of his fingers. Kobe Bryant. Infinity, infinity to zero any day in basketball. You hear that, Joel? And yes, and yes, he sings better than Justin Bieber. All right? So it's, yeah. The title of my lesson this morning, Is God Your Hero? Is God Your Hero? Let's open up to Psalms 18:46. Give me an amen when you're there. All right, it says here. The Lord lives. Praise be to my rock. Exalted be God, my Savior. He is the God who avenges me, who subdues nations under me, who saves me from my enemies. You exalted me above my foes. From violent men you rescued me. Therefore I will praise you among the nations, O Lord. I will sing praises to your name. He gives, great, he gives kings great victories. He shows unfailing kindness to his anointed, to David and his descendants forever. Man, David knows that God is his hero. It says that he's my savior. You know, he avenges me from my enemies, right? And you know what's so cool about heroes? Like, I mean, kids, like, where's the preteens at today? Can you raise your hand? All right, awesome. There's like two of you here. I'm kidding. All right, cool. Well, you guys know, I mean, you know when a kid has a hero, right? I mean, because they try to imitate him as all get out. You know, you'll, they'll be at the house. They'll be running around. They put a cape on. You know, they put goggles on maybe. Um, actually, I have a picture kind of like... That's got kind of like that. <laughs> All right. Well, just to let you know, that's not me. That's Filipino man. Okay. <laughs> he just um, he happened to be at my apartment last night. I just took a picture of him. So, yeah, they try to imitate him as much as you can. And the question this morning, okay, if God is your hero, how much are you trying to imitate him in your family? You know, in your, I'm sorry, in your in your job. You know, when you're around your family, when you're around your friends. 
How much are you trying to imitate him? You know, the thing with um, heroes as well, like when you ask a kid um, their hero, they'll try to defend him. If you try to talk down on their hero, they'll try to defend him as all get out, right? You know, for Filipinos, we love Pacquiao, man. Oh, yeah. He never lost to Bradley, okay? Just to let you guys know. He never lost to Bradley. You defend him. Yeah, so if, if God is your hero this morning, will you take a stand for God? Preteens, will you take a stand for God? And that's, that's what leads me to my first point, taking a stand. And we're going to read none other than David and Goliath as our text this morning. So let's go to 1 Samuel 17. Let's turn over there. All right, so verse 1. David versus Goliath. 1 Samuel 17. Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled in Socha and Judah. They pitched camp at Ephes Damim, between Socha and Ezekah. Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Elah and drew up their battle lines to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another, with the valley between them. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. He was over nine feet tall. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs he wore bronze greaves and bronze j javelins was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like weaver's rod and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him. Okay, I want to stop here real quick. Okay, David. Man, he was nine feet tall. I can't even like reach that high. Nine feet tall, right? We all know who Danny is. I mean, he's 6'4", but this guy, he was like the shield bearer basically to David. <laughs> I mean, to, to Goliath. Okay, this guy was was tall, man. He was scary. And I actually have a picture of him, but I'm going to warn you. It's kind of scary, okay? <laughs> yeah, there he is. Yeah. <laughs> actually, <laughs> he's actually my roommate, so it kind of gets weird. But I just fed him to take that picture, and he was happy, so. So there's Goliath, all right? Scary guy. All right, nine feet tall, man. Verse 8. Goliath shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? Are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine said, This day I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Okay, it says here that the Israelites were dismayed and they were terrified. You know, basically, um, Goliath was a bully. And you guys, I mean, preteens, you guys know how bullies are. I mean, I remember in the sixth grade, I was bullied. On the bus stop, man, I would get um, spit balls thrown at me, flicked in the ear. I mean, that was the worst, man. And you guys know what bullying is. And so this, was, this, who, this is who Goliath was. He was a bully to the Israelites. And he struck fear into them. Now, let's pick up in verse 12. <clears throat> Sorry. It says, Now David was a son of an Ephrathite named Jesse, and he was from Bethlehem in Judah. Jesse had eight sons, and in Saul's time he was old and well advanced in years. Jesse's three oldest sons had followed Saul to the war. The firstborn was Eliab, the second Abinadab, and the third Shema. David was the youngest. The old, the, I'm sorry. The three oldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to tend his father's sheep at Bethlehem. For forty days the Philistines came forward every morning and evening to take a stand. Now Jesse's son said to his son David, Take this ephah of roasted grain and these ten loaves of bread for your brothers and hurry to their camp. Take along these ten cheeses to the commander of their unit. See how your, brother are, how your brothers are and bring back some assurance from them. They are with Saul and all the men of the Israelite in the valley of Elah, fighting against the Philistines. Early in the morning, David left the flock with a shepherd, loaded up and set out. As Jesse had directed, he reached the camp as the army was going out to its battle positions, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines, facing each other. David left things with the keeper of supplies, ran to the battle lines, and greeted his brothers. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out from his lines and shouted his, his, his usual defiance. And David heard it. When the Israelites saw the man, they all ran from him in great fear. Now the Israelites had been saying, do you, see, do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his, father's, his father from family... I'm sorry, his father's family from taxes in Israel. David asked the men standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? They repeated to him what they had been saying and told him. 
This is what will be done for the man who kills him. When Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the man, he burned with anger at him and asked, Why have you come down here? And whom did you leave those few sheep in the desert? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. Now what have I done, said David? Can I even speak? He then turned away to someone else and brought up the same matter. And the men answered... The, the men answered him as before. What David, what David said was overheard and reported to Saul, and Saul sent for him. All right. This is a pretty cool part of the, uh, part of the text here because we see David and the, kind of how he was and how he was treated. He was basically like a little boy. He was youngest of the three older brothers, and he wasn't really allowed to do anything. You know, he had to stay back. He wasn't allowed to go to the battle. He had to take care of the sheep. And the only reason he can go to the battle was to bring food, which is kind of a lame responsibility, you know. He wanted to be there at the battle, but he wasn't really allowed to do anything. And I remember just being young. Like, I remember feeling this way. Like, man, I, man I, I'm not able to really do anything. I know preteens, like, man, you guys have a curfew. You guys have chores to do. You can't drive yet. And I just remember feeling like there's a, this one part, um, or when I was younger, uh, my brother, or my grandpa, basically, he bought a, a shiny new tricycle. He used to love tricycles. And he would ride it around. And so we're all playing on this tricycle, right? And we wanted actually to go to the park with it. And we're actually, we're all on the tricycle and we're small so we can fit in there. So we're just riding and we, and we wanted to go to the park and my brother's like, man, let's take this to the park. I was like, all right, let's go. But then my brother said, all right, Aaron, you can't come because you got to be 10 years old to go to the park. It's a law. I was like, what? I was nine at the time. I was like, yeah, can you just like not tell anybody? But they just took off without me. And I was like, oh my gosh, man, this is so lame. You know, like that, it sucks to be me right now, you know? <laughs> not sure. Yeah, it sucks to be right. No less, like, no less make a difference for God, you know? Like, how can I make an impact for God when I'm this young? I can't really do anything. I know you guys feel that way. But let me tell you, man, God doesn't feel the same way. Man, God doesn't care about how young you are. And I want to look at a scripture in 1 Timothy 4.12. Let's turn there. It says here, Do not let anyone look down on you, because you are young. But set an example for the believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. Preteens, do not ever let anyone look down on you because you're young. See, God doesn't care about how old you are. Man, God cares about your faith and your heart. You know, but are you willing to take a stand for him? And I'll tell you what, man, like, man, there's nothing more inspiring to see a young person doing what's right. There's nothing more convicting than that. Man, God so desperately wants to use you guys. You know, but you gotta take a, you got to take a stand for him. And so practically, you know, when you're at home or at school, and you see something that's just not right, you know, cursing, uh, cheating, bullying, man, take a stand for God. And, I, and you know what, man? It, it gets scary at times. I'll tell you, it gets scary. And you guys might be scared. But let me tell you, let me let you guys in on a little secret. Preteens, like, you look all around, we're, we're all, I mean, there's a lot of adults here. We have on ties. We act and talk like adults, but honestly, we're scared too. And we get scared all the time. But that's why we have, seek, and pursue a relationship with God. Stand up for God. Point two, facing the giants. Let's continue with our story here. Pick up in um, verse 32 here in Samuel, 2 Samuel. <clears throat> all right, let's see. Uh, verse 32, David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, you are not able to go out against the Philistine and fight him. You're only a boy. And he's been fighting man from his youth. David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off the sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, we will, deli we will, will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. All right. So this is really cool, man. We find out that David, he was prepared. Man, he was trained spiritually. He was ready for this. And he, he didn't go out against Goliath unprepared. It says here that he killed a bear and a lion. Man, that's pretty, that's pretty awesome, right? I mean, I know if that was me being a shepherd taking their sheep, I'd be like, man, Mr. Lion, Mr. Bear, go ahead, man. We have a lot to spare. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's a lion and a bear, dude. But we see here, like, when you think about shepherds, they're alone, you know, when they're taking care of their sheep. And we see um, David here, he was fully devoted to whatever God had him doing. 
You know, are you guys fully devoted? When no one's watching, are you guys doing your homework, right? When no one's watching, are you doing the right thing? You know, and, and for adults here, like, whatever your role in the church is, are you doing it with your whole heart? You know, God has something prepared for us, but if you're not ready, then it'll never really come. God knows, man. So before we face our giants, we have to definitely be spiritually prepared. You know, there's no way we can face our giants without being prepared. And preteens, like, man, this is training right here. You know, being at church. Like, when you're at church, stay in the room. You know, listen. You know, um, be engaged. Uh, write down questions. And you can, ask it, um, you can ask it to your parents, you know, after the service. Um, take advantage of the family devotionals. You know, be engaged. Be involved. Go to preteen camp. I know preteen camp's fun. I've never been there. Uh, but I know it's awesome. I always see the pictures and the sharing. It's always awesome, man. So take advantage of these things. And another thing, like, man, you can ask one of the, the teens or the campus or the single bro uh, brothers or sisters to hang out with them. You know, maybe once a week. Or maybe monthly. You know, like, ask us. You know, don't all come to me after the service, but there's a lot of us. We're all here. Just find us. But, um, yeah, man, I mean, ask us, you know. Um, as far as teens, campus, and singles, like, we need to make ourselves available. You know, I think a lot of the times, like, we, uh, I like to call it our, we get into our own kingdom instead of God's kingdom. And we're focused on our own kingdom. And, you know, we, we get caught up in the things that, um, that we think is important, but I mean, honestly, man, when it comes down to it, God's church is first, you know, and God's kingdom is first, and um, I just think, yeah, that's, that's definitely a need. You know, we got to make ourselves available for them. I mean, we have to be the examples, right? And so, um, as far as parents, like, I'm not, I don't have, obviously, a family. I do have a household, though. I live with Goliath, um, Rick, Augie. Um, and so we have a spiritual household, and obviously if we're not getting together and, and having spiritual times together, praying together, we're not going to be a spiritual household. You know, sin is going to creep in. Um, and that's how Satan loves to work, is through disunity. Um, and so parents, man, make it a priority to get with your guys' families and pray with them, you know? Um, teach them. Make it a priority. Um, as far as just personal spiritual training, like, I know the marriage, you guys just came from a retreat. I know it was awesome. <laughs> you guys got awesome spiritual training there. And when it comes to, like, just spiritual training, I think we all know, like, disciples, we know what we have to do. I mean, it's, it's quiet time studying at your Bible. But one thing that I was taught um, when I was studying the Bible, you know, reading, um, reading and spending time with God, it was, that's what it was. It was spending time with God. And my question this morning, like, do you still love to spend time with God? You know, are you making it a priority? You know, do you still love to spend time with God? All right, let's uh, continue with our story here. Verse 38. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on, on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I'm not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of the shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, approached the Philistine. I want to stop here real quick. This is mainly for the preteens. Okay, you don't have to look cool to serve God, all right? You don't have to dance, dress, and sing like Justin Bieber to serve God, all right? You see, I mean, we, <laughs> we see here that David, he didn't care how he looked, man. I'm pretty sure, man, when he put on that armor, he felt tight. You know, he was ready to go, but he's like, no, nah, man, I can't go in these. You know what I mean? So when you're serving God, man, you don't have to look cool. And you might get made fun of, but I'm sure David got made fun of from, for, for bringing a sling instead of a sword. You know, he got made fun of probably. And so it doesn't matter... Um, how you look uh, when you serve God. Amen? All right. Verse, um, we'll continue for, uh, with our story. All right. Okay, now for the giants. You guys ready? Yeah. All right. Meanwhile, the Philistine with a shield bearer in front of him kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was only a boy, ruddy and handsome, and, the des and he despised him. He said to David, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give... Your flesh to the birds, flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. David said to the Philistines, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. This day the Lord will hand you over to me, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. Today I will give the carcasses of the Philistines army, army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the, that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. As the Philistine moved closer at him to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. 
The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down to the ground. I actually want to show you a picture real quick. I was supposed to show it earlier, but I just want to show this because I think it's funny. <laughs> yeah, that's not looking cool, okay? So he didn't care about looking cool. That's David right there. But anyways, I, I forgot to show you guys that picture. Um, and so me, Goliath, and David live all in the same house. It's kinda, it gets kind of crazy at times, but, but anyways. So with this story, man, this is, man, this is truly amazing, right? <laughs> Boldness, courage, faith. Man, David is awesome. David says here in verse 40, this is my favorite part, he says here, All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's. And he will give all of you into our hands. Man, David knew who his hero was. Man, he, he proclaimed it. And see, when I was growing up, man, like, my heroes, I, I really love sports. So um, there are a lot of uh, sports figures that I looked up to. Michael Jordan, the greatest basketball player ever. Um, Stone Cold Steve Austin, he was a wrestler. Uh, the, Rock was a <laughs> the Rock was a wrestler as well. He was a, um, yeah, he was one of my um, heroes growing up. And then Oscar De La Hoya was a boxer. And so... But honestly, you think about your heroes, man. Have they ever saved you or rescued you? I mean, I know for me, man, they never came to my rescue when I desperately needed it. If anything, my so-called heroes influenced me to do the wrong thing, make the wrong choices. I mean, Michael Jordan, he got a divorce. Um, Stone Cold Steve Austin, he drank beer and alcohol on TV. Um, Oscar De La Hoya uh, struggled with uh, drug abuse. And The Rock, The Rock's still awesome, man. I have nothing really bad to say about him. <laughs> He's still making movies, and it looks good, man. He's, he's cool. Um, so I can't really say anything bad about him. But, but anyways, I mean, you think about it, man. Like, man, I, still, I needed a hero back then, and I still need a hero today. I mean, gi giants and challenges, they don't ever leave when you get older. They just kind of change. And, you know, preteens, for you guys, like a big giant is the giant of peer pressure. The giant of peer pressure. And I want to look at 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Let's go look at that. It says here, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. And basically what that means, it's, just, it's people turning you into someone that you don't want to become. You know, growing up, I had three cousins, and they're all the same age as me, and we, we went through school together, and they were basically my peers. Um, and also my older brothers, they're a big influence on me. But as I look back in my, in my past, man, there's so many things that I'm so shameful of, you know, that I hate talking about. And honestly, I wish I, became, I, wish I made God my hero when I was a preteen. Um, you know, like, man, I really regret just, uh, just impurity, um, a lot of drug abuse when I was younger because of my brothers. Well, I can't blame them, but I mean, they kind of influenced me to do that. And honestly, man, I can't, I can't tell you how many times I made my mom cry. Yeah, there's things in my past that I really regret. And honestly, like, I got caught up with bad character, and I became the one with bad character because of peer pressure. And so when it comes to peer pressure from your friends or classmates or, or sense that something's wrong, man, just take, take a step back and think. Okay, is this something that God would approve of? You know, would David do something like this? You know, would he take a stand? Or if you don't know if God would approve it, then just ask, like, hey, would my parents approve of this? You know, take a stand for God. Um, internal giants. So these are giants that, not, I mean, we can't necessarily see, but they're there. And these internal giants, the internal giant of pride. Your own pride can hold you back from serving God. And I was trying to think, like, how can I explain pride to somebody? And I think, I mean, I'm just going to give an example. Um, I remember, man, like I told you guys, I love sports. I love basketball. I love to play. And um, my oldest brother, man, I could never beat him. He'd always beat me in basketball. He would kill me. And I remember the first time I beat him, man, I was so excited. I was talking so much trash. I was like, man, you shouldn't play basketball anymore. Dude, give me your shoes. I told him, like, Just give me your shoes, man. You can't play anymore. And so, and every time I was doing it, I'd go swish or I'd go face. We used to do that a lot. Face. No one does that anymore, but we used to do that all the time. And I remember the next day, right, I, I go down to the, uh, the local gym and I go play. I, I rode my bike down there and I saw another kid there. And um, he had his bike there, and I was like, man, I'm going to play this guy. I beat my brother. I can beat anybody kind of thing, right? So I played. I was like, hey, man, let's make this interesting. All right, whoever wins gets the other person's bike. I was like, all right, let's do it. So I was ready, man. A long story short, he beat me. <laughs> and I walked home that day. I walked home that day just humbled, man. And see, that's what pride does, man. It blinds us. I was blinded, dude. Man, he took my bike. <laughs> yeah, and it was, it was because of pride. It's because of pride.
Uh, let's go to uh, let's go to First Peter five five. Let's look at that. Take my bike, man. All right. It says, "Young men, in the same way, be submissive to those who are older. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, because God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble." Man, I hope and pray that we're living by the scripture. You know, this is one of the scriptures that, man, we got to memorize. You know, um, you know, it says here, you know, young men or young women, be submissive. You know, be submissive to your parents. They have the best interest in mind for you guys. Be submissive to your elders. You know, we always say in the kingdom, humble yourselves or what? Or God will humble you, right? And it's so true. It's so true. And a perfect example of someone that got humbled was Goliath. I mean, it said he was a proud champion. He mocked the Israelites. He couldn't even believe they sent a, a, um, a young boy to face him. But what happened? He got his head cut off. He didn't lose a bike. That's kind of worse. They lost his head. So I think I had <laughs> the worst of it. All right, another giant. I'm on, you guys still with me? I'm almost done here. Okay. Uh, the giant of discipline. Uh, the need to be, to be disciplined is something we can all relate to. Let's go to uh, Titus 2, 11 through 12. Titus 2, 11 through 12. It says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. He teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age. Okay, the Bible calls discipline here self-controlled. And honestly, I think the hardest thing about living for God is just being self-controlled. It's being consistent in this. You know, being consistent. And you know, the thing about consistency, like it, it doesn't, or discipline, it doesn't mean to be perfect. You know, what I think it means, it's, it's basically to, be, to become a little bit more like Christ every day. Just a little bit. You know, working towards that goal. You know, making little changes daily. And so, for example, like if you want to get in shape, let's say, I mean, don't go in the gym for like four hours straight until you, you know, you're in shape. I mean, you kind of want to go in there for 30 minutes maybe, the next time, 45 minutes, so just making little changes until you get to that goal. That's definitely helped me in, in being disciplined. Um, let's turn to uh, 2 Timothy 1.7. I want to read this real quick, because God is with us when we try um, to be like Christ, when we're, we're giving our hearts to him. It says, For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and self-discipline. So God is there, man. He's helping us. He's pushing us to do the right thing. You know, take a stand for him. Take a stand to these giants. Um, and so whatever it is, whatever it, whatever, whether it's the giant of pride, whether it's the giant of discipline, a uh, giant of peer pressure, man, take a stand for God, man. Make him your hero. Um, in closing, uh, I just want everyone to think real quick. Okay, who was your hero growing up? Just think about it real quick. Who was your hero growing up? You know, preteens, who's your hero now? Now ask yourself this question. Have you ever met your hero? I mean, there's a few people in the world that ever really get to meet their hero. And when they do, it's a handshake, a photograph, uh, maybe um, an autograph. But man, see, the reason why God is so awesome is because he wants to know us. He wants to meet us, you know? You know, the reason I made God my hero four years ago is because I get to have a personal relationship with him. He gets to know me, I get to know him. Let's make God our hero. Thank you.